So our next speaker also works uh, in the US government, but he works in a different branch. In the, uh, he's the director of IARPA and has worked his way up through the organization. I'm totally going to mess up what IARPA stands for, the Intelligence Advanced Research Priorities Activities? Close. Project Activities. Excuse me. Um, and um, IARPA works on a variety of really interesting research projects, some having to do with prediction, other things uh, in the assistance of the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency. Um, as we heard from Tom Khalil, they often work in collaboration with uh, other organizations and fund interesting projects from collaborators who uh, are trying to help the US government improve its own intelligence capacities and be at the cutting edge of research. Um, I'll let him introduce his work a little bit more, but Jason Matheny. Um, thanks. So, uh, so, so Tom um, uh, talked about many of the great ways of, of working in government to be engaged in uh, advancing science and technology. Um, I'll, I'll talk about uh, a, a few different ways uh, within government to advance technology development. And I, I want to, uh, first I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how I uh, became involved uh, in, a, in, the, in government working on technology. Um, I'll then sort of argue for the proposition that um, developing technologies or affecting the rate of technology development is one way to substantially affect uh, good in the world. Uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll argue for a second proposition, which is that uh, one way to substantially affect the rate of technology development uh, is to work in a variety of different roles in, in government. Uh, so, so first, when, when, um, when I started out uh, my career, I worked in, um, in, in public health and sort of traditional infectious disease control, epidemiology, cost effectiveness analysis of uh, things like, uh, you know, new drugs and vaccines against malaria and tuberculosis and HIV. Um, and and uh, really found that, um, that work and continue to find that work um, of, of, of critical importance to, um, to determining sort of long-term welfare uh, on, uh, on the planet. So I think that, that as sort of a, a area of endeavor is one um, that I continue to think is, is really important. I know a lot of you all are, are involved in that kind of work. In about uh, 2002, uh, um, uh, there was uh, a set of discoveries relating to how to, um, to build a virus from scratch uh, without requiring that you find um, a example of the virus already, uh, the, um, the technology uh, that was being developed um, that we now call synthetic biology uh, was making it possible to uh, take the chemical constituents of a virus uh, and create a new virus uh, in the same way that you know, one might create a piece of computer software. Um, and a number of us who had worked on infectious disease control um, you know, going as far back, say, as the uh, eradication campaigns for smallpox, saw this as really a, a landmark uh, because it meant that some of the diseases that we had to worry about would be diseases that we had previously eradicated, but now it was possible to reconstruct, uh, or diseases that we had had no prior experience with um, because they were truly novel uh, and possibly much worse than their natural, natural variants. Uh, so it was, it was at, at that time uh, that I moved from traditional public health work uh, to, uh, to work in, in national security and, and national intelligence. Uh, and I think one of the things that um, I've appreciated about working in this, in this community is that there's a sense both about the opportunities and the risks for many emerging technologies. Uh, so, so one of the things I want to um, argue for is that for, for those of, of you who are, who are interested in, um, in careers uh, of effective altruism, I think there's a lot of gains to be made from, from looking at technology development as a driver of, um, of, of progress uh, globally, and also as a, as a potential risk that will require um, management and, and careful thought. Uh, so, we, we have on the positive side examples of technologies like sanitation, uh, antibiotics, uh, vaccines, um, 
the development of, of uh, say, uh, dwarf strains of wheat um, or of synthetic fertilizers that collectively have saved over a billion lives in the, in the last century. I mean, these are, these are some of the highest leverage investments that, uh, that society has made, and the, the, um, uh, the, the benefits from those really do uh, sort of register in the billions. Um, and, and you can look at, at individual technology developments that have had a massive impact on, on welfare in the globe. Uh, so to take as, as one example, uh, Norman Borlaug's development of dwarf strains of wheat uh, in the 1950s, um, that alone is, is credited uh, with, uh, with saving hundreds of millions of, of lives. Uh, and in, in one instance of its introduction uh, in South Asia during the 1960s, probably saved over 50 million lives over a five-year period. So if you think about um, what we gained from the development of that technology, uh, but, but just as importantly, what we would have lost had that technology been delayed. Uh, we're, we are talking in the tens of millions of, of lives just due to uh, the possible delay of a, of a, of a technology's introduction. Uh, that's the kind of direct impact that technology development can have on welfare. Uh, there, I think, is an equally important indirect impact of technology on welfare, which, uh, which is the effect that technology has on moral progress um, by reducing the cost of adopting certain kinds of ethical norms. So uh, to, give, to give one example, in, in the 18th and, and 19th centuries, the introduction of mechanization uh, made it possible for an ever larger number of people uh, to become abolitionists. Uh, and to adopt the view of abolition as a moral stance because the cost of doing so was, was much diminished. As another example, in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, um, the reduced cost uh, of, um, of food preparation uh, and uh, food preservation uh, meant that half of humanity uh, no longer needed to be uh, confined to domestic services, uh, which then enabled uh, an increasing part of society uh, to adopt a moral stance about gender equality. Uh, so these are, these are historical cases of technologies in a way enabling moral progress by decreasing the cost of acting on our best moral impulses. And I think we can see uh, current examples today. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, if, we, if we develop uh, a, a cost-effective and um, and, um, and, and convincing uh, substitute for meat, um, that would allow uh, an ever larger fraction uh, of people uh, to, um, to bring in line their diets with their, their moral impulses. Uh, so this is an indirect effect of technology, is to make it less costly uh, to act on those moral impulses. Uh, and together, those direct effects of technology and those indirect effects of technology I think represents substantial positive aspects uh, of the development and acceleration of technology. Uh, there's also the negative uh, effects of technology development. Um, and some of you who are, who are focused on uh, catastrophic risks or, or existential risks, I think there's, there's an argument to be made for, for why that's a really uh, important set of issues for, for effective altruists, because there's so much value uh, potentially in our future uh, that ensuring that we have a future uh, counts for a lot. It has a lot of expected value. Uh, most of the high probability uh, existential risks appear to be technological in nature. So we do have uh, you know, natural hazards, uh, you know, um, asteroid impacts, supervolcanoes, uh, nearby supernova or gamma ray bursts. Uh, those sorts of events, though, have annual probabilities less than one in a million. Uh, it seems like the, the anthropogenic technological risks have higher probability than, than one in a million per year, whether that's uh, nuclear war um, or biological warfare uh, or, uh, or cyber warfare. Uh, so dealing with these technological uh, threats um, requires that we both make wise choices as a society about what kinds of technologies uh, to accelerate, but also what kinds of technologies to decelerate or to invest in differentially. 
Uh, so differential technology development um, could include increasing the investments in defensive technologies while you're at the same time trying to de decrease investments in, in offensive technologies. And for most technological risks, uh, like nuclear weapons or biological weapons or cyber weapons, the defenses do require new technology development. Uh, for example, our, our main defenses against uh, novel biological threats are the development of things like broad spectrum antibiotics uh, or vaccines or better diagnostics or new approaches to detecting disease outbreaks much earlier than traditional methods. Uh, as another example, there's been, I know, much discussion this weekend about some of the potential risks uh, from advances in, in artificial intelligence. And it seems like many of the most promising routes to uh, approaches to AI safety involve investing in technologies and verification and validation uh, of autonomous systems. Uh, so I think that any um, sort of balanced portfolio of technology investment uh, that's meant to uh, accelerate on balance human, human progress is going to require inv investments in, um, in defensive technologies. And that's, that's really, I think, um, at the crux of my argument for why technology development is so central uh, to improving, uh, improving welfare. Uh, but there's, there's an, another proposition uh, that I have, which is that a effective way to, um, to affect the development of technologies uh, is to work in government. Um, Tom Khalil is one example of somebody who uh, has spent much of his career um, influencing uh, to the public's good a range of science and technology efforts. Uh, coordinating them in a way such that they're more cost effective and picking uh, the, the hardest problems in science and technology that can contribute most to public welfare. Now, clearly there are lots of places to affect technology development. Uh, for instance, one could work directly on uh, inventing new technologies. You could work in, uh, in industry, you could work in academia, you could work in a government lab. Um, you could fund the development of technologies, you could work uh, for a venture capital firm, you could work uh, as a manager in an industry organization that has a large research budget. You could work in a government organization uh, like mine, um, or you could become rich and, and fund it yourself. Uh, you, could, you could also um, work on science and technology policy at, a, at the higher level, as, as, as Tom does, uh, in being able to shape the priorities for national investment. Uh, and that, that affects uh, not only the, um, the funding of research, but also the, the kind of attention uh, that it receives from various stakeholders. You could also work at a, at a think tank uh, that influences uh, the direction of, of science policy, and you could work as um, a science journalist or a science communicator uh, who helps to bring attention to some technologies. Uh, that it's not an exhaustive list, and I, I, uh, I think clearly there are a range of, of ways in which, um, as individuals or groups, we can influence the direction of technology. Um, so I, I don't know enough to, to argue that uh, one is better than another, but I'll argue that you can have a substantial impact uh, by working uh, in, in government funding organizations. Um, and I'll, I'll give two examples. So um, one is to work in a, in a funding organization directly. Uh, like, say, the National Institutes of Health, uh, or National Science Foundation, or one of the ARPAs, like the Intelligence ARPA, where I sit, the Defense ARPA, Homeland Security ARPA, or the ARPA for, for Energy. Um, at those organizations, an individual government manager uh, can personally direct tens of millions of dollars per year uh, into uh, research projects that otherwise wouldn't occur. Uh, so the counterfactual is this work really doesn't happen uh, unless that program manager decides this is going to be a, a priority for investment. Uh, it's possible, uh, but I think very difficult, to earn that much money uh, to give. Uh, you know, when I, when I thought about how to uh, do good in the world, I thought about, well, should I try to become, you know, an investment banker and earn that much uh, to give? And at least uh, my own assessment of my own uh, skills and likelihood of sort of achieving tens of millions of dollars per year in income in order to, to donate uh, made me less um, optimistic about that than the other option of, of working on the funding side to direct uh, research dollars to places where it could do the most good. 
Uh, so that's, that's why I came to IARPA, it was the, the prospect of having a multiplier effect on my own research effort to be able to fund uh, hundreds or thousands of researchers smarter than, than, than I am to work on the problems uh, that I think are, are most important. Um, and a couple of examples of the sort of work that we funded that I think touches on the kinds of problems that have been discussed this weekend. Uh, IARPA uh, collaborates with Microsoft Research in funding um, a new kind of mosquito trap, a smart mosquito trap uh, that traps mosquitoes of specific species based on their wing, bit fre wing beat frequency, and uh, mosquitoes that have um, already obtained blood meal uh, so that you, they can then be sampled for uh, what kinds of diseases they're carrying. And this mosquito trap is now being deployed in, in Florida and Texas for monitoring uh, Zika. It's also been deployed overseas. Uh, now, the goal for a place like IARPA is to be able to detect uh, disease, disease outbreaks um, uh, at the earliest possible moment uh, so that um, our own public health um, uh, uh, facilities can be prepared for an outbreak. Um, but you can think in more general terms about what's the value of having earlier detection mechanisms uh, for diseases, the ability to uh, develop vaccines sooner, the ability to uh, mobilize antivirals. Um, so this is, I think, one example of, of the way in which a research project can be accelerated to public benefit. Another example is work that we do um, in, in uh, two programs run by Christy DeWitt at IARPA uh, to develop new tools for uh, detecting trace amounts of nuclear isotopes or chemical weapons uh, remotely. Uh, and that kind of work then helps with our non-proliferation efforts to try to detect uh, nuclear weapons development or chemical weapons development. Uh, a third area is a program called FungiCat, uh, run by John Julius, which is looking at new methods to screen uh, orders for commercial DNA synthesis. Uh, right now, uh, there's only voluntary screening uh, by companies that produce DNA uh, at scale. Uh, so the goal of this program is to, uh, is to screen uh, DNA orders, uh, not only for existing uh, pathogens, uh, but also for novel pathogens. Uh, you heard possibly um, on, on Friday Phil Tetlock's uh, talk uh, about the ACE program, which was uh, work that uh, IARPA funded, running a large geopolitical forecasting tournament, and, I, and there's, a, uh, there's a panel later in the day on, on forecasting and some of its benefits. From that program, we were able to gain a lot of insight about um, the promise and peril of various forms of, of forecasting, forecasting disease outbreaks, forecasting macroeconomic events, uh, foreign elections, um, uh, political instability, interstate conflict. Uh, and that puts um, society in a better position to understand where it can be confident about certain kinds of predictions and where it must remain humble uh, and most resilient to uncertainty. Uh, so that's an example, I think, of, of work that can be done on the funding side. Uh, the other example, though, is, um, is to do uh, work on the policy side. Um, and I think what, what Tom Khalil has done at OSTP is the sort of model for the, the kind of career that one would, would like to have uh, in, in science policy. Um, so for those of you who are policy inclined and also have a, a STEM background or a STEM interest, uh, my advice would be try to become Tom Khalil. Um, I mean, Tom has uh, you know, cumulatively affected where billions of dollars uh, have gone in federal research investment uh, and has really built coalitions across agencies uh, that allow that money to be spent cost-effectively on, on some of society's most pressing challenges. Um, so one way to have a significant impact as, as an effective altruist uh, is to pursue that kind of path uh, in, in science policy. Um, in, in, a, in a way to, uh, to close, um, you know, in, in looking at, at this room, I sort of see like how many of you all are, are sort of early on in your careers um, and I, 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 I both am extremely helpful and then also um, uh, sort of um, uh, envious uh, because, you know, I came at, at this sort of topic of, of thinking about how to do the most good most efficiently uh, fairly late uh, in my career. You all are, are very early, um, so you have an opportunity to do decades of high-impact work uh, that benefits the globe. 
so my gratitude to you, um, and I, I hope I can answer um, any questions uh, about how to pursue technology development in government. Okay, so Roxanne told me there's an, there's an app, which I'm going to now. Um, okay, so one question is, how do you predict and measure the impact of IERPA projects? Um, so, uh, so IERPA, uh, when, we, when we feel, um, like when we, when we have a, a large amount of intestinal fortitude, we sometimes think about applying prediction markets to our own projects. Uh, and, and sort of evaluating what's the probability that a given product, project will succeed or fail. Uh, we haven't done that yet. Uh, we only sort of fantasize about doing it. Uh, but one thing that we do do is um, when we launch a program, we ask the program manager for their own probability of success, and we keep reevaluating that uh, as the project continues. We also have external uh, panels that we bring together. Uh, but we need to do more, I think, in sort of forecasting our own efforts uh, uh, following our own, our own best prescriptions. Uh, the way of measuring the impact of IRPA projects uh, is that we, we look how, at how the technologies are actually used, um, and then we, um, we get a lot of reports from uh, the kind of uh, effect that the use of that technology had on a particular mission. Uh, because it's national intelligence, we're not often allowed to say a lot about how um, a technology made an impact. Um, I can say we've, we've funded technologies that have had um, a, a big impact on, um, on uh, early detection of Ebola in West Africa. Uh, we've had um, successes in deploying technologies that have uh, substantially increased our ability uh, to counter ISIS um, overseas. And we've developed technologies that um, I think are really making breakthroughs in our ability uh, to understand uh, how the human brain um, operates at a nanometer scale uh, up to a micron scale, uh, as well as advances in uh, fundamentals of, of computing. Another question here is, um, uh, how do we make sure that government-driven science and technology is friendly? Um, and I, I think this is the importance of pursuing uh, roles in, in government uh, science and technology um, is so that people like you um, who, um, who have a commitment to making the world better um, are helping to inform those decisions about uh, what sort of research is funded. Um, one thing I've been very impressed by in uh, my work in government is um, by the moral impulses of uh, my colleagues. Um, but we need more people um, who care about making the world better um, in all of our institutions. Um, one question, uh, has there been anything you funded that you've regretted funding uh, at IARPA? Uh, there are programs that um, have failed, uh, that is, they technically didn't meet their goals. Uh, there, there are few projects that I have um, sort of moral uneasiness about because our programs are evaluated as concepts before they're launched. They're evaluated in terms of what kind of impact will it have on civil liberties and privacy, what kind of impact will it have um, on human health, uh, what kind of impact will it have on national security and public safety. Uh, so I feel very good about that progress. Um, I, I think the, the kind of uh, thing that I feel most uneasy about um, is should we have been doing more on areas that we might have, have neglected? Um, and I think biology is one area where we're really trying to catch up. I think we're, we're about a decade behind where we'd like to be in terms of, of biosecurity technologies. Uh, one question is, applying for IARPA grants currently requires a big time investment, uh, often with a low probability of success. Um, are there any plans to lower the cost of such applications or to make the process more predictable? Uh, so one thing that we're increasingly making use of, uh, and thanks in large part to the Office of Science and Technology Policy, is prize-driven challenges. Uh, so not requiring that somebody write a grant application in order to be paid for a solution to a pressing problem. Uh, so we run challenges in which we post an open problem. Anybody can compete for a prize, a dollar prize, um, in solving that challenge. 
Um, some of them are machine learning challenges. Uh, some of them are um, challenges related, for instance, to um, uh, developing high-resolution 3D maps of uh, geospatial imagery. Um, so how can you avoid the sort of melted chocolate uh, views that you get in, in, say, Google Earth, and in fact get uh, fairly crisp representations of, of the Earth? Uh, we have an open challenge on that topic right now, and we have uh, several others that we're going to be announcing before, before the end of the year. Um, one, one question is, um, collaboration is hard. How does IRPA streamline collaboration with so many different players, and what are some best practices? Uh, we, we collaborate with um, uh, you know, over 50 uh, different government organizations and then multiple NGOs uh, and, and companies and universities and colleges. Uh, that collaboration, uh, we haven't found any shortcuts apart from uh, the, the sorts of things that humans have been doing for millennia, uh, which is meeting um, and coming to agreement or at least uh, identifying areas of disagreement. Um, so for most of our projects, collaboration uh, requires an awful lot of communication. Um, and as much as we would like for, um, for uh, Skype or video conferencing uh, to replace travels from Maryland to Virginia and back, uh, for the most part, most of our collaborations require lots of in-person meetings. I think I have time for one more question. Um, how has your previous work affected how you think about your work at IARPA? Uh, so, um, you know, because I had more of a, a traditional uh, public health background, um, I, I think I came into this work um, looking for opportunities for national intelligence to benefit public health broadly. Given the number of things that um, we work on, though, in national intelligence beyond health, uh, it's made me concerned about a variety of emerging technologies, not just biotechnology, uh, but also optimistic about the opportunities that we have to substantially advance welfare by making the right kinds of bets uh, in technologies that um, can truly advance prosperity. Um, I think one of the, um, one of the goals that um, the Effective Altruist uh, movement has that I feel um, uh, a lot of affiliation with is um, doing that sort of careful risk analysis and cost-effectiveness analysis of lots of options. Uh, when I look back at, at, at the career that I've had, um, I think there were lots of you know, competing um, uh, job opportunities that I thought about pursuing. Um, but IARPA, for me, was, was, um, was a, good, a good pick because it, it really did allow me to fund so many bright um, uh, uh, researchers throughout academia and industry to work on the, the, the same kinds of problems that I was working on myself. Uh, and with that, I think we're done. Thank you. <laughs>